And welcome back to the to the Think Bunker. This is Bunker Brief number seven. And before we begin, uh, just a quick thank you to our. Uh, if you are a returning viewer, welcome back. We're glad that you enjoyed this content and that you're well, just back for another one. If you are a first time viewer, this is not the only content we do. We do other kinds of content, but this is the, the uh, easiest for us to do. And check out the other stuff. We also have some more projects coming, and it's been a minute since we've done this. And to mark that, uh, I'd like to state that Kento is back. Kento, he he, had, he he resolved some of the issues that made him have to leave in the first place a couple months back. But he's back, and fun fact, we have the whole gang here, as you can see. With that out of the way, you see what we're going to talk about today. The history of combat and placements from the year zero. Starting off, Will, is castles. Castle. So this is one of the... I'm going I'm to go ahead and take the spotlight here before any of you get a chance. This is one of so my anyways, favorite castles on this list. <laughs> <laughs> so this is one of my favorites on this list. And before I go into a deep dive, let's address something. Before. Castles are not fortresses. I know, I know. Gasp on all of your hatred. Castles are like a bastion of sorts. So it's not... But not the kind of bastion you're thinking of, all right? To get a picture of what a castle is, let's make a couple of definitions. So a fortress is a military stronghold or garrison normally on its own. Castle is a large building in medieval periods fortified against attack with walls, towers, and your occasional moat, blah, blah, blah. You know, castles were not built as a military point of strategy or anything. They were often the center of a society. They housed the king and all of his merry men. Castles were not fortified to protect, not, or they were fortified to protect, not attack. So, now, of course, as years progress, wars break out, and boom, your kingdom's gone, and all you have left is your castle. And at that point, yes, the castle becomes a fortress. It's alone, surrounded, full of troops. This is where you see all the cool siege scenes and Lord of the Rings and crap. So, castles were normally not as big as we picture either. A lot of castles were smaller and built by wealthy families within a kingdom for their own clan, slash family, slash tribe, whatever. I have two castles in my family personally, and I can assure you both were not magnificent Disneyland princess castles by any means. So castles were more of a last center of resort slash government building of a larger kingdom. So essentially castles were family estates, if you will. They were... Um, and, and I did put in my notes... Uh, that strongholds and ca castles did function. They had many. They were very functionally different. However, and castles mm -hmm. themselves specifically are uh, family legacy stuff that you build this to. Uh, you build this, and that's your clan's name, and that mm -hmm. and that's just what a castle is. But and then that differs from strongholds and fortresses. Where they are more, they're more for built for military operations. The photos on the the two photos on the right there are, I believe, examples of such. Yes, those are more forward front lines kind of castles. The ones on the left are more, you know, your average capital building in the United States. This is the stuff that you go, you don't attack, you go. Wow, I'm proud to live in Idaho. <laughs> I there, um, no offense to my Idahoans, but uh, there's not. I don't think there's not a lot. Well, I mean, it's better than California. A anyways, uh, <clears throat> and I'm I'm saying that uh, truthfully, but uh, I I will say that the reason I said castle is because it is a generalization that everyone can understand. Big stone building, you put troops or you, it's it's a guard. It's it's something that keeps things out or can protect things inside. That's the point of a castle, stronghold, and fortresses. Uh, that is the point of those big walls. But here at the Think Bunker, we like to teach you things. So we're going to teach. So we just taught you, as uh, C Four just did, what the differences are. Um. Also, note that castles are not necessarily walled cities. Around the time that you're seeing large production of castles. There are walled cities. Um, Rome was a walled city. It is not a, considered a castle because it is a city surrounded by a wall. Um, That's a good point. Mm, very good, the, actually. 
because a walled city is an actual population. It's got a whole a whole society and area encompassing it. It is not simply a military fortification. It is a fortification for a very large and expansive area. Uh, on one of C4's points, I got two castles uh, as an example. Castle Dunbar. It was, I believe, the first castle in Scotland, and it was built in 1070, I think, was one of the dates I found. Right. The castle itself is in a strategic location at the mouth of a port. Uh, it's built on a peninsula overlooking the entrance to the port city of Dunbar. Um, Dunbar's, yeah, Dunbar's uh, on the coast. I don't know when I was... My left and right brain got crossed. Dunbar is uh, 165 feet east to west and 210 feet from some points north to east. It's not very big. But you also have stuff like the Himeji Castle in Japan, which it, at one point wasn't a castle, but as a castle, it had a measurement of, uh, had a length of 3,120 to 5,250 feet from north to south, and a length of, uh, uh, sorry, I misread that, uh, 3,120 by, oh, to uh, 5,250 north to south, as far as its dimensions go. So it's this large, all-encompassing complex. It is not walling in a city. It is walling in the buildings that surround the government offices in government offices and support buildings. So the uh, guards, barracks, foods, uh, extra food stores, uh, all of the attendants are housed in there, and anyone that you would need for government or military operations would have been able to be housed in that facility. It's also a very beautiful building. So yeah. castles, their size and uh, location is dependent on what kind of army you have, what, so what kind of weapons you have, the resources that pe the nations have available to them, and what is the locational necessity of having a fortification there. A lot of these yeah. interior cities with a lot of resources, they're built as sort of an art piece. They're not for frontline combat, or at least they're not intent for that. They can suffice but they're effectively an oversized mansion. Right, and that brings up a really good point. The prettier the castle is, the beautiful or er, the surroundings are, and the less ideal places they are to get to. These castles were built, like the castle on the left here. The scenery is literally something out of a Disney movie, right? And that's because this place is in no immediate threat. So they built this large, exquisite castle to be like, hey, look what I have. Whereas the walls we see on the right are from something that would have been put up as almost as fast as possible to provide adequate defense from, you know, certain demise. Mm -hmm. So the location and, you, and necessity of it played mm -hmm. a big part in how pretty the castle looks. Not to mention the fact that another thing that you have to note about castles and fortifications is that a lot of them are built and their colors and their color patterns differ due to where they're where they're located. Uh, not specifically castles. I don't know any examples of those off the top of my hand. But uh, there's a friend, there's a German town who is named. It's named after the material of rock that the houses were built out of because that was the materials around, and the houses look a certain way because of the rocks themselves. And it looks different from uh, another town that was in France that was named after the same same thing, the same rock material that we, you would that you use to build houses and buildings, but 
it's different. It's a different color due to its geolocation. Yeah, I think you're talking about Oberstein there. Mm, yes. Yeah. So that's the one that was, they they decided. Huh. Let's get creative. Our town is made out of this. Let's name it that. Exactly. I guess Paris should be named. What well, should be renamed to uh, Bones? Oh, that'll do too. <laughs> because it's built on top of a. Well, I mean, it's ooh, uh, catacombs. I want. I want to actually go into the catacombs, but uh, regardless of that, if that's all we have for castles, um, um if I you guess have talk, anything else? Talking about any, like, per, talking about Paris for a second. You have the Bastille um, in Paris, which was originally built as a fortification within the city. Uh, <clears throat> to guard uh, one of the approaches into the city of Paris at one point, um, mm. but was also used as a prison. So it doesn't look, per- at least it didn't look particularly good. It doesn't exist anymore uh, because it was destroyed. Mm. Um, uh, but it was not a very glamorous structure because it was built for primarily military purposes and as a prison. So you're not going to see complex archi- architecture with like um, dark oils and gothic style artistry on display at the Bastille because it is purely a military functional function over aesthetics. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm good on castles. If if everyone else, if you have anything else to say. Please make your points known. Uh, otherwise, we'll be moving on. Good here. I'm all good here. All right, we're moving on. Next is bunkers. So, bunkers typically they're overall well protected from you, uh, from bullets, from bo- from explosives, from shrapnel. They're they're they function similar to that of a stronghold or fortress, where it's you can house your troops, you can keep them out of the weather, out of uh, uh, you can funnel them in to protect them from uh, enemy for uh, enemy threats such uh, artillery, airstrikes, and you can also you can launch attacks out of them. But you also had things where you can link them to networks. And you had a network of pillboxes, think the Normandy bunkers, uh, the Normandy fortifications, uh, and Maginot it, line. the Maginot line, which actually, funnily enough, uh, top left, where you can have, that's where you get really into the wacky stuff. And you, I, I'm, didn't the Maginot line had a, have, have a root? Oh, that's another thing, actually. Speaking of the Maginot line, some of them were built underground. You had a lot of, that was another thing that uh, castles did have. Or sections underground, but bunkers were were mainly well. The more elaborate ones you can think of, uh, bunker systems were built underground, and these ones up top above the surface were pillboxes or just entry and access points to get inside. But a lot of them were built underground because because whether you like it or not, the ground is the best protector against most threats to you in a war in a war zone. Very true, um, and in World War One, you'll see the very some of the very first bunkers were literally just you know let's dig a hole under this inside of our yeah. trench. <laughs> yeah, and uh, now th- I, I will note that there is a difference between a pillbox, which is just a concrete structure with a machine gun in it, and a bunker proper, because yeah, you can have a bunker that leads to the pillbox. The pillbox itself is just the is, for example, if you look at the top right and the bottom left pictures, those slits. That's a, that would be a pillbox. Yeah, your pillbox is your gun port on a tank. It's part of the bunker. Right. It's it's the bunker's equivalent to the uh, Sponson machine gun, if you will. <laughs> uh, spe- uh, so specifically, the top left image that is one of the artillery mounts for the Maginot Line. That was really cool because the French. Uh, wanted the ability to raise and lower them so so as to ambush the Germans because the profile would be super close to the earth and they could possibly ambush troops and open fire on them without knowing where the bunker was initially. 
So they mm. would be hydraulically raised and uh, fire from their positions. There were some of these ones that were raised and lower that were uh, had cannons. Uh, I believe there was one that was some kind of mortar and machine guns. And all of these would be connected uh, through a series of passageways uh, where the troops would either walk through or there were sections of the Imaginal line that had train tracks in them, which is kind of strange. And the But the train would move faster than the troops running down the hallways, so they would all get on what would effectively be mine carts and get shuffled up and down the line as they were needed. Um, unfortunately, the French couldn't extend the Maginot Line because they ran into the water table of of Europe uh, just at at the Ardennes. So they couldn't extend the Maginot Line without it costing significantly more and having to like pump out the water and reinforce right. it. Because if you just if they continued to build the Maginot Line, it would have they would have had massive flooding problems through most of it, and with the amount of electrical wiring running through the lot line, it would have been a complete mess. Right, but, I mean, I gotta give it to the French, that's a really cool concept. Imagine you're marching through a field, and you see small little circles start rising out of the ground. That's a really cool concept, if only it worked. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and, and, the, the and, Americans, the Americans trying to break through some of these fortifications uh, in like the Hindenburg Line during World War II, it was uh, rather expensive in terms of human lives in how to deal with them. Right, and it required it a uh, heavy artillery bombardments, armored support. There's a whole lot of resources you have to pour into attacking it. Something like this. Yeah, right. but no matter goes how all the way back to Sun Tzu's Art of War. For every one defender, you need three attackers. And no matter how, but I will say, no matter how uh, tenacious the defenses are, you'll never beat a redneck and a welder. <laughs> well, the, the other thing that's really good about bunkers is that with a lot of uh, or, or pillboxes, these concrete fortifications, they're significantly cheaper to produce than an entire fortification system. Like, um, during the 1500s to about the 1800, yeah, 18, late 1800s, you're seeing, still seeing construction of very large above-ground fortification networks. Um, Stuff like Fort Pulaski, uh, Fort Sumter. Um, trying to remember a, a European one. Uh, uh, end it all. I, th I um, think a good example of, of one would be would be like the uh, the Normandy defenses because they were just a well in really terms of like fifteen hundreds to eighteen hundreds large fortifications. Um, oh there, yeah, you know there, yeah, yeah, there, yeah. there are a couple of fortifications at the mouth of I believe it's a Thames River uh, that were built around that time, but they're super expensive. Um, mm -hmm. and because they're heavy stone, it's not like it is a dirt mound where, you know, you get the, bring a bunch of engineers and then they can build it with the ground they have available. Um, you've got to move in stone or mine it directly where you're building. If you're really lucky. Oh yeah. Uh, but that's bunkers, what they're using a lot in, uh, Iwo Jima or well, yeah, they, Pacific. they, they dug into the mountain. Yeah, it's good. It's it's significantly less expensive. So, so, whoa, what are we going to uh, make of our defenses? Uh, yeah, see that mountain there? Yes, that. That right there. Uh, to be fair, you would think the was, was canceled. <laughs> hey, uh, d disclaimer, if, if, if for whatever reason you find offenses are doing an Asian impression, I am half Asian, so. All the half. Now we're only half canceled. 
Yeah, you're um, fine. The rest of us are over. Yeah, we're done. But with uh, these smaller bunkers, not only is it cheaper to produce, but it is less centralized. So if something terrible goes wrong, let's say a shell uh, flies in through that little slit on the bunker and it hits ammo inside the bunker and or pillbox and everything just explodes. It's not going to hurt you that much because you've lost one out of, like, 30. If something terrible goes wrong uh, in these large-scale fortifications, Mm -hmm. they go wrong horribly. Right. And... um, Um, and See, with stuff like the Siegfried line and the Normandy defenses, if one pillbox is taken up, you still have other pillboxes and fortifications around it that are just connected via trenches or uh, trench lines and stuff, uh, rarely connected with passageways like the Maginot line. And you still have a decent defensive integrity if your troops can, can hold, can hold the, uh, the invading force back from the other surrounding pillboxes and not use the pillbox they that the invading force just took out as a as a launching point and cover if your troops can retake that pillbox then you still have a good defensive integrity right mm. and um yeah so for, that's all i have for bunkers good here uh, yeah i'm all i'm all good here since we're since we're only talking about basics we're explaining a basic concept we're not going into specific bunkers where, like, we're not dissecting the Maginot line, which would be an interesting thing. Yeah, the, but that's a video worth of its own. Yeah. Also, Simple History did one, so, you know. non um, So, I'm, I'm, I'm good if we want to move on. Uh, sideburns, okay. what about yourself? All right. Um, all right, we're moving on. Trenches, uh, generic First World War joke here. Uh, why is my foot falling off? So, trenches mm. are the evolution, or I rather I say the shadow of the Napoleonic tactic, which is where you get, you know, the funny haha lines of men shooting at each other. Well, you have that going on, but then you have a stalemate. Well, you want your men to defend themselves, so they dig a hole to sit in. Well, those holes want to connect to other holes, trenches. That it's two trenches are two lines of. I say trench trench warfare was a brutal, dreary, sustaining, long stalemate sustaining tactic that lasted, which made up the entirety of the Western Front, and it's what all the films are about. Uh, funnily enough, the Russians and the Germans in the Eastern Front during the First World War, didn't really do all that well, uh, in regards to just long, drawn-out stalemates. These, and... The, the the thing with trenches is, like I said, it's still, it's still a shadow of the former Napoleonic Wars where you have your two lines, and some of, some of the conditions that these men were subjected to in the trenches were awful. Um, trench foot, I, the reason why I make the joke about trench foot is because they... It gets his name from from this uh, era of war because the trenches, if it rained, would fill with water, and your feet would be in that water all day to the point where your foot would literally rot off. I don't have a picture of it. You can look it up yourself if you really feel so inclined to. I know everyone else be here instantaneously is. demonetized. Your um, discretion is advised. Exactly. If your if your discretion is advised. Uh, this is where everyone started making the transition from the wool caps to the steel helmets, because when you're in now, when you're entrenched, you're and you're peeking above the trenches. That's why people moved from the the Brody helmets in the pictures to stuff like the M ones, where they uh, during during the Second World War because was because of the lessons in in trench warfare. Because if you stuck your head up above the trench at eye level, if you look at those Brody helmets, you either have to lean them down forward, or you have, or you you pretty much have half your forehead exposed. And we've gone into that in our previous video about the development of U.S. service helmets, which you should watch. Right. Mm-hmm. And just uh, hit on that point that you just said: trenches were built 
rather quickly for long-term engagements. They were not something that, you know, quality of life. These things were built in a rather short period to carry out the entire war. I mean, they did have some quality of life things. Well, the nicer later. ones. You know, years later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the the, the th- uh, Talking about, like, moving from large-scale fortifications... Like castles, fortresses, bastilles, um, citadels, to uh, pillboxes and bunkers, and taking it to its ultimate extreme of making it as cheaply as possible while in, uh, s- uh, spreading it out as far as humanly possible. That is trenches. These things are just dug into the ground, they only take manpower and limited resources to make a basic one. There were German trenches that were very nice during World War I that got a lot of quality of life upgrades, but a lot for assembling a trench, you just need a man who is functional and a shovel to build a basic trench. Right. And with the cost so low, and with its effectiveness so high, and the dispersion be ha, being able to cover an entire swath of a battlefield in emplacements, it was a no-brainer that most of the armies went for this. It was sensible, it was super effective, and with the weaponry they had, they were actually usable. Now, yeah. with trenches, there are some trenches that do go underground or are covered. They're still considered trenches because they are not a set-upon structure, or it is down to the military doctrine of whether or not a covered trench is considered a bunker. In most cases, they are still considered trenches, because that's what they started out as. Right, they would um, most likely be covered as... as um, call, they would be designated as covered trenches. Uh, Cyber, were you saying something? <laughs> mm-hmm. True. Mm-hmm. There were and a couple then, of instances that, in World why... War. There were a couple instances in World War Two. Where these trend, where castle structures were used, um, they varied in effectiveness. Yeah. You, you have stuff like at the Battle of the Somme, there was a structure there, um, and it's kind of survived bits and pieces of it, but a whole lot of people died there on both sides. And you have stuff like the Americans building the concrete ships in the Philippines where while they were abandoned, they were not destroyed, and you can still go to them if you want to get tetanus. <laughs> and, 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 that's, and that's why, uh, and to, to Cyburn's point, he brings up a good point in warfare about, uh, just, well, warfare. The reason the castle would go down, the reason why I, a bombarding, or rather holding up in a castle in this era of war would be so detrimental would be because all your men are in that stronghold, and now it's leveled and now all your men are dead whereas that same firepower to eliminate points on the trench well your men are spread out and they're not in a concentrated area so that's the that's that's the point here is that it it it's um you don't concentrate your men in a fine point anymore so that they all get leveled in an artillery bombardment uh, and trench warfare was just awful because it was like that's why I say it's again Napoleonic because you had the officers and their lines of men and then from there that, that developed into the trenches and and the way as as if you don't know for whatever reason 
you start an engagement by shelling your enemy to brimstone and back, and then you get your men out of the trenches, you charge across no man's land, which is, if you look at the bottom left image, that space with those two lines, two prominent lines, those are the trench fortifications. Well, in between there is what's called no man's land. Well, there's a reason why. No man lives, hardly. And when you and you send your men across, they attack the the enemy trench if they're successful. If if anything, it turned into how many men can we kill before we come back? If you take the trench, cool. But we need to gain this much ground, and it didn't go well a lot of the time. And then you'd come back, and then the enemy would then in turn counterattack. And it was a big whole thing of trading blows, and it was it was quite an awful experience. Uh, talking about something you had said where you don't want all of your troops or your resources in one area. In certain situations militarily throughout history, it has been optimal to basically have a line but have a concentrated area that you know your enemy wants to attack and throw a lot of stuff in there because you don't want your enemy to attack the rest of your line. So you kind of make an area where they will naturally uh, advance upon. Mm -hmm. um, now, if something goes wrong there, let's just say you build a, a very fancy fortification, your enemy winds up digging under the fortification and puts several thousand pounds of explosives under it. Oh, yeah, I forgot about these. Sends it into the sky um, where you're done. Mm -hmm. But That's if funny. your enemy attacks it like Operation Citadel, where they've got a lot of resources... Uh, uh, yeah, Citadel was cursed, right? That is correct. Yeah. So, Citadel, the Soviets throw a ton of resources men, trend, um, entrenching equipment, artillery pieces, AT guns, you name it, it's there. Uh, a 13-year-old, yeah, give him a gun. Uh, a whole bunch of resources going to this point that they know is going to be attacked for multiple sides because they want to engage the enemy because they believe that they can win it. Now, if Citadel went horribly for the Russians, it would have been catastrophic. But it didn't, and it was a way that they could sort of consolidate their lines while keeping their firepower, uh, their, uh, how to say this, uh, force concentration high enough to meet the Germans man for man. Right. And then in turn, the Germans have already exhausted more than they need to, so they exhaust more men, and then now they're... Uh, men in that area have been depleted. Uh, funnily enough, if you go to uh, if you go to Europe and you see these big old perfectly circular lakes, chances are that's likely what that is. It was a the idea was during the wars you would dig un during the First World War you dig underneath each other's trench and set off a bomb as as Kanto just mentioned. That is the result. It's just. Okay. Massive crater. And a lot some of them turn into lakes. Some of these turn out really well, but others turn out horribly. This happened during the American Civil War. The Union dug under Confederate lines. They blew a hole open in the Confederate lines. They killed like 2,000 men instantly. Super effective. They charged up into the crater and then got stuck in the crater. Minor problem. Uh, then they all got shot in the crater, like fish in a barrel. Minor problem. I think that, is the, that is, the, is the most literal warfare definition I've heard of for fish in a barrel. Yeah. That, was, that, that, is, was, that is the most accurate description of that. It was horrific. Uh, there is, there's a scene from a movie where it depicts that battle, and there is a documentary that talks about it, or more or less the engineering behind the mining operation in it. Check it out. I uh, forget the battle. I'm just drawing a blank right now. Just trust me, bro. Uh, source, trust me, bro. Um, what? Uh, what's your source? I made it up. Anyways, that is what I have. That's all I have for trenches. Uh, what about everyone else? 
Good here. I'm good here unless you want to talk about how right angles on trenches is actually a good thing. That's a joke. Um, uh, the Germans did the math. Having right angles in your turns in a trench significantly reduces the chance of your infantry dying uh, from artillery impacts. That, that is sense. all. Yep. That. Hello. Painful existence with the Think Bunker here. Uh, this is not the usual ending we put to our bunker briefs. This is because we're cutting this video into two parts. YouTube doesn't like it when we go from 45 minutes to an hour, especially two and a half hours as we've done in the past. I don't blame you for not watching our videos at two and a half hours, but rather YouTube cuts the amount of people it recommends our videos to. As such, we're going to cut the video here, and from there, we will upload the part two tomorrow. By the time that you'll see this, by the time you see this video, as such, um, have a good morning, evening, or night wherever you are. Uh, get back to work. I don't pay you for nothing.